weekly basis. Um, so just be anticipating that in the coming weeks. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the letter of First Corinthians. We are uh, endeavoring to embark on a series about giving. Uh, we're not uh, talking about, I've said this I think every time I've gotten up here, we're not talking about giving of your time, right, serving in the church. We did that uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about Ephesians chapter 4, about each member serving in the body. We addressed that. This series, which we started last Sunday and this Sunday, and I think we'll have one more week uh, of messages as it relates to the issue of giving money uh, as part of our walk with the Lord. Uh, so a lot of times when we think about giving, as I said last week, we sort of are hesitant to talk about that. We're sort of reluctant to, to speak about money because it's such a sensitive topic it, because I think it's abused in a lot of ways and it's misunderstood in a lot of ways. And I hope that this little series will help us as a church think more clearly about what the Bible teaches about giving. And we started that last Sunday. And if you want to hear that introductory sermon, you can go to our website and listen to that. But this morning, we're going to be in our text that we started with last week. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. Uh, so I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have it open to this passage because I'm going to read it. And then we're going to look at what God has for us in this wonderful text. So the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says this. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. You know, the theologically minded Paul is not too spiritual that he does not address the practical needs of the church. The matter of giving and receiving is just as important to the Apostle Paul as declaring right doctrine. Because what undergirds Paul's mind is theological truth that produces the right kinds of actions. This is what governs the Apostle Paul. And that's why he does not shrink back from declaring to this church in chapter 16 some very practical matters. So here Paul, in context of 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing uh, this church on many issues. If you read the whole letter of 1 Corinthians, you're going to discover that Paul is addressing the disunity and the divisions that's in this church, the factions that are within this church, some saying they follow Peter, some they're saying follow Jesus, some they say they follow Paul. He's addressing issues that they're having. There are issues of morality that are immorality that are taking place in this church. There's issues about marriage, Christian liberties. They're abusing their Christian liberties. They're hurting their weaker brothers. All these kind of things are taking place in this particular church. Paul even addresses the issues of the Lord's table, even the, the thing that we treasure. As the body of Christ, something that we look at as a memorial, as a remembrance. They were even abusing that most sacred ordinance. And when we come to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, we see the Apostle Paul addressing the most sacred doctrine of the Christian faith, which is the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul takes ample time to declare the veracity and the importance not only of the gospel but of the gospel and the implications of the resurrection so the apostle paul stands on the on the mountaintop of theology and preaches and teaches about the excellencies and the and the reason for the resurrection and then in chapter 16 so practically paul turns these attention to the practical needs of the church, and that is the collection. So Paul here is not too ashamed to go from one glorious truth of theology to talk about money, to talk about meeting needs of other churches. He sees this as his job to help the church be obedient 
to the issue of giving. The Apostle Paul, in this most wonderful text, really lays out five principles that govern the church's giving so that the church might glorify God in all that it does. And the issue at hand is for this church, the church at Corinth, to gather together with other churches to supply the need of another body. You see, in our modern day, as we think about giving in the local church, there are many questions that often arise, right, about this very important issue. We know as believers, <clears throat> many of us here today, we know that we're supposed to give, right? We're, you know, whenever you were saved and you were discipled, one of the things I hope your discipler said is part of your spiritual discipline is to give to God. And many of us probably didn't know that, right? Many of us probably introduced ourselves to Christianity, and maybe this was not something that was talked about. Or maybe they said you have to tithe, right? You need to give 10% of everything you have to the Lord in, in your monetary gifts. Then we have questions about, well, how am I to give? What, what standard am I to give to? Are we to... Or do we give to earn God's favor? Are we to give to, you know, get in good with the church? What are the reasons why we are to give? Well, the Apostle Paul here in this passage is going to help us today in 2020, or 2021, uh, to really think clearly about what it means for the local church, what it means for each individual Christian in his responsibility or her responsibility as it relates to this most uh, sacred thing that we get to do, the privilege of giving. So this morning, without any further ado, I want us to begin to look at these five principles that we as a church need to consider if we're going to be faithful to God in the act of worship when it comes to giving. The first thing I want you to notice this morning in these five principles that Paul lays out is that the giving was church-centered. The giving that Paul is encouraging is to be focused solely upon the needs of the local church. And you notice this in the passage. Paul here is writing these instructions. It's instructions, because look at the first few words of the verse 1, now concerning the collection. He's, it sounds like, because he is addressing a question that they have about his uh, desire for them to collect money for a sister church. And now he's addressing that very issue. Paul sees that topping off this letter with this question about the collection, he's saying, here's what you are to do. But the first thing I want you to notice with me is how church-centered Paul is. Paul looks at, if we look at this passage, we see more than three churches addressed. If you look at verse 1, you see the saints, you see the churches of Galatia, and then you see the little phrase, so do you also. All of this is reminding us that they're giving, that he's encouraging these churches to give to another church. And we notice this in verse 3 as well. Look at verse 3. He tells them, I will send letters, uh, he says, I will send with them letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So the goal of all of these churches is to make this collection to give to this local church. So Paul here is speaking to the local church giving to other local churches to support those local churches, to see those local churches established. That's what Paul is addressing here. So this verse encompasses at least, at least three. And we know it's probably more because here he's referring to the churches of Galatia. He's referring to churches in a particular region. So this collection, as we see here in verse 1, is in support of of the saints. Who are these saints that Paul is referring to? Well, obviously, it is the saints in Jerusalem. And Paul's goal here is once this collection has come to its end, Paul will make on his third missionary journey to each one of these churches to collect what has been given so that they may give it to the church in Jerusalem. So Paul here is giving very detailed... Now, this is what I want you to get this morning, okay? I want you to understand that these are details and specific instructions that translate into our day as well, okay? This is not like, you know, what they did is what they did. No, this is what we are to do as well. This is not a disconnect between the churches of Paul's day 
and we do not follow the same principles laid out here. No, God's word applies to them as it applies to us in this time. So Paul here lays out very clearly that his passion is to see local churches arming in, going arm in arm to support one another. So this collection is going to the churches are to the church in Jerusalem. Now I want you to just see something with me this morning. Flip over a few pages to the letter of Romans to chapter 15. And I want you to just see Paul's um, celebration, so to speak, his accommodation of the churches of Macedonia in Achaia and their willingness to participate in this giving. Notice what Paul says in verse 26 of Romans 15. He says, For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So again, we see Paul clearly saying that these churches, churches in Macedonia, churches in Achaia, they were willing, they were pleased, they were happy to make this collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. So we see these churches coming together for a common goal. With these, we see these churches coming together to say, hey, there is one church in our network who needs support and we're willing to do what is needed for us. So I think one question sort of maybe rises to the occasion here is this, this fact. Why did this church at Jerusalem need help? Well, in Romans 15, he just said the poor within the church at Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem in its initial days was the pillar and support of the other churches. That's where everything began, right? I mean, the church at Pentecost, this is where the church was birthed, and it was very successful. Over 3,000 people were a part of this body. And then the persecution hit. Economic hardship hit this region. Persecution also drove the church to be scattered. And you can think about just the natural ramifications of persecution. If you were known as a Christian, how hard would it be for you to get a job in an area like that when they thought maybe you were a troublemaker or they thought that you were against the state? We can see this being a very real hardship. We can also see that the economical struggles of that time would be the influx of pilgrims who came from all over, the, all over that region to Jerusalem who got saved and stayed in the church at Jerusalem and how that overburdened that church. So we can see that there would be great need in this local body. If you look at Acts of chapter 11, you don't have to turn there, but you might want to jot this down. And in verses 27 to 28, Abagus, who was a prophet in the church, spoke of a famine that would come to the land. So this would also be enough information for us to see that from all that took place in this area caused some economic hardships for this local church. And this local church was suffering. And these were all the factors that Paul was taking in consideration in collecting this offering that they would give to this local church. So Paul's goal is to support these believers. This is another faithful church supporting another faithful church. But it's also helping these other churches see that it's better to what? It's better to give right, than to receive. And the Apostle Paul here is passionate about this. He is passionate about these local churches working together to benefit one other church. Now, as a side note, there, there's some really important truths here uh, by just way of implication of how like-minded churches ought to see it to their advantage to link together for the purposes of ministry. For the purpose of spreading the gospel, not just linking arms with other churches just to link arms, but linking arms with other churches who have a like-mindedness that does cause us to be able to work together for the glory of God. This is what we see Paul doing. All of these churches that Paul is addressing, he has had some kind of hand, whether he planted it, supported it, established it, all of these churches, he was their spiritual father. And he goes to each one of these local assemblies and says, hey, you need to take up an offering, you need to take up a collection that would help this other church, our mother church in Jerusalem, survive these hard days she finds themselves in. Now, you see the passion of the Apostle Paul in this idea of local churches helping local churches in how Paul describes the collection. 
Now, the Apostle Paul uses about five different synonyms for this gift that they're to collect. If you look at 1 Corinthians 16, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, he uses numerous synonyms that sort of give us a clue into how important this gift is. Now, I'm going to give you these synonyms. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I just want you to write these down because this should shape and color your understanding about your own giving and how it is to be used in the church. The first word is here in verse 1, the collection, logia, is the Greek word. It means an extra collection. This term might describe monies that are, that are given after we have paid our obligations. What might be your obligations? Taxes, your own well-being, groceries, gas, whatever it might be. But then the collection, the logia, was monies on top of that. Extra monies. And that's what he's referring to these there. Then the second word I want you to notice is in verse 3. He uses the word gift. The gift to Jerusalem. This is the word charis. The word where we get grace. Um, And Paul looks at this collection as a free gift. Think about it. It's a free gift given by this church to another church. No obligation, no compulsion, just a willingness to give a gift out of the overflow of one's heart because of the love that God has given to you for another brother or sister. The gift, Paul says. Then I want you to hold your place there and turn to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1, and in verse 12, Paul uses another word where we get our word deacon from. Very, very interesting. Look at verse 1. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry. That word ministry is referring to the collection, the gift. And Paul is telling us here that the gift that Paul had in mind is a service. Think about this. It's a service to the needs of the people. So this word is where we get the word deacon, a servant. And this word here describes that the gift that this church is going to be giving is going to function as a ministry tool. Do you ever think about your giving like that? Do you ever think about the fact that when you give money to God, God uses that money as a ministry tool? Listen, it is so nice when you see a brother or sister in need and you can go to them and use your hands to support their need, right? Help them work in their home, help them change a tire, right, on Sunday morning when you go outside and you realize you got a flat. Help them change their oil. Help them do whatever practical thing you might do. Help them fix electrical issue in their home. It could be numerous things that you might do to serve your brother or sister with your physical hands. But when Paul uses this term, ministry, as it relates to the collection, he's saying money can go where your hands cannot. Money saying it is a ministry to the needs of people. Look what he says in verse 12. He says, For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, so he says it's going to supply for their needs, it's going to meet their needs. He says this needs of the saints, but it is also overwhelmingly through many thanksgivings to God. So the Apostle Paul uses several synonyms, and another one he uses is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 20. In verse 20, Paul says this, Taking precautions so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this, notice the synonym, generous gift. Paul here speaks about this money as a generous gift, and it has the idea of a large amount of money that is collected. And this is why Paul says taking precaution. Because they knew that this collection that would be done, gathering all of this money from all of these churches, would be a very serious and important issue because it would be a large amount, a large sum of money. 
And Paul here did not want there to be any slanderous word brought against him or anyone else on his team. So what did they do here in this context? They built safeguards so that this generous gift that was given would be taken care of. Number four, or number five, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, or 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, Paul uses another word. And here we see this word described as bounty. In verse 5 he says, So I thought it necessary to urge you, brethren, that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previous promised, look at the word, bountiful what? Gift. So that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. So the Apostle Paul here is describing their gifts as bounty, right? As excess, as them willing to give open-handedly, not with sticky fingers, right? Not with covetousness creeping into the heart of the Christian, but their bountiful gift would be what they would be giving to these churches. So we see here that Paul uses different words to describe the nature of the gift that they're collecting. Gordon Fee, in his commentary, which I really love this quote, makes this point. Now just listen. He says this, All of this, speaking of these synonyms, together suggests that the collection was not some mere matter of money, but was for Paul an active response to the grace of God that not only ministered to the needs of God's peace, people, but also became a kind of ministry of God himself. Now really think about what he is saying. He's making this point that when the body of Christ does its job, it is like God, right, working in his church to meet the need of the church. This is what Paul is telling us here when we give. When we give, church is giving to support the local church. We are giving and God is giving that church what it needs to survive, what it needs to be successful. So when we give to God and we give to the local church, we are giving exactly where God intends. That's why giving here at Grace Bible Church is so important for us. Because our success in obeying Christ, our obedience to Christ is seen when we give to the institution by which God has determined to bless. What other institution has God determined to bless in this world? Marriage and the church. And therefore, we need to be about giving to the means by which God is reaching the lost. And this is what Paul is pointing us to in this passage. But I want you to notice another practice or another practical truth about giving in verse 2. The giving was not only to be church-centered, but the giving was to be regular. Look at verse 2. The Apostle Paul clearly says, on the first day of every week, let's just stop there, right? Here we go. This is how giving is to be done. It is to be regular. Paul is declaring here in these instructions that on the first day of the week, this is a note about the habit of giving. So this church, when they made this collection for the church at Jerusalem, however long that might have been, they were to, when they gathered on the first day of the week, they were to bring what they had determined to bring. Now this has both a practical application and a theological reason. Listen, the practical application was to gather this collection so that on this day they would have the collection already made when Paul came. I mean, he makes this point very clear in the text. He, really, he reminds us that giving on Sunday is important until he comes so that this collection is already made and it's ready for him to write these letters and to send the team on to Jerusalem. So this, plays, this, this truth even plays out here in the local church today. We gather money on Sunday like we did this morning. We drop some money in the offering plate because we are collecting that money on this day for what? For ministry needs. Now, we do this because you don't want the elders or anyone else calling you at home and saying, hey, we have needs, we need you to give this much money. No, we are determining at this time, as Paul declared to this church, that when we gather together as his people, we are putting money into that offering so that collection is made so that it is used 
when there is a need. So this practice uh, is very practical, but it also is very theological. Notice what he says. On the first day of every week, every week, the first day of the week was to be set apart as the day believers gathered to do what? To do what we're doing today, to worship. Dr. Luke, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, makes this comment. He says, on the first day of the week, speaking of Christians gathering, were gathered together to break bread. This became the habit of the local church from the very beginning. And why did the local church meet on this day? Well, it was setting a historical precedent. And Paul's encouragement here is that that is to continue. Those, the practice of meeting once a week was obviously something they were doing. He said, so when you gather on that particular day, you gather so that you can give. I believe Paul here is outlining that we should give something every week as part of our worship on Sunday. This is the regular pattern for giving found in the New Testament. Now, why do we gather on Sundays? Because this is the day Jesus, what, rose from the grave. This is the day He rose from the dead. This is the pinnacle of our faith. It is a conquering Savior. And we worship on that day. That's why on this very day we are to give as well. So the pattern here that Paul sets forth is on the first day of the week. And he says, notice the text, of every week. Now, this always begs some questions, right? People look at this and they say, well, I only get paid once a month, right? Or I only get paid twice a month or whatever it might be. Well, Paul's not really addressing that issue. He's addressing the issue of the fact that we should be, this church should be doing what? Giving every Sunday. Every Sunday. And I think there's some practical reasons for this. You know, many people, you know, if they do get paid once a month, twice a month, I used to get paid once a month when I was a fireman back years ago, and I, when I initially got paid that, I hated it. Because it made you really disciplined to meter out that money for four weeks. But then once you learned that, you kind of enjoyed it, right? It was kind of like a good thing. But all of us, no matter where we get paid, we ought to determine in our hearts to be able to give something every week. Now, Paul is addressing this. He's making this point. And I think it's a, a worthy point for us today. And we'll see more why this is a more of a worthy point. But here's one of the practical applications of this. If part of our worship is to give, shouldn't that be something we do every week? I mean, whether we give, you know, if, whether, no matter when you get paid, you can still determine to give something every week. Now, here's the other thing to consider. The Holy Spirit may work in your life. You may get extra money one week. And God may want you to use that money for His glory. God may want you to think about giving that. And if we come every week with the attitude that everything I have is God's, and every, all of my possessions are God's, and whether I get uh, something I didn't expect, or whether I'm learning to manage my money and give money on a weekly basis, it causes me to be sensitive to what? The Spirit of God each and every week. The Spirit of God, like, Lord, how would you have me give this Sunday? Rather than going, well, I just, you know, I'm just going to give once a month, or I'm going to give twice a month, and I'm going to write one check, and I don't think about it. I don't think that's really, I mean, that may be the leading of the Spirit in one way, but I think when we tangibly ask God, Lord, what should I give this Sunday? Rather than making it a, a law, well, I'm just giving this amount, dropping it in the plate, and moving on, Right? That's just like singing a, 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 um, a hymn without really thinking about the meanings of the words. And I believe God wants us to give from a sensitive position of what, God, what would you have me do with the monies that I possess? Because every need in a given week, is it the same? What did I say last week? What did the Bible teach? We give to support who? People within the church. 
And if we lock ourselves into giving once a month or you know, twice a month, and not every week, we lock ourselves into not being sensitive to the Holy Spirit in the needs of the body. So I believe this, this, this command here that Paul is giving to this church has practical, spiritual applications as to the habit of our giving. It should be every week. So Paul outlines for us the habit of our giving, but I want, you to know, I want you to know how we are to give. The third point here is that giving was for everyone. Look at verse 2. So verse 2, we see, he says, On the first day of every week, each one of you. You see that? This is Paul addressing everybody. Everybody. Here Paul is saying that giving is for everyone, each one of you. This is for the whole congregation. Paul is not segregating the rich from the poor and saying only you. I mean, he, you know, he's not like a politician here. We're going to take from those who have and give it to the have-nots. That's not the position. It's who? It's everybody in the congregation is to worship God through the act of what? Giving money this is what Paul is addressing. Every one of us. This is a corporate responsibility. Each person is to give to the Lord. Listen, it's not a matter of how much we have. It is a matter of giving what we have to God. You understand that? This is what Paul's talking about. It was like, well, pastor, I don't have a lot to give. That's not the question. The question is, are you giving as an act of worship? No matter someone's financial status, they were called to give to the work of the ministry. That's what Paul is saying here. The pattern of giving has always been like this among God's people. When God begins to move in the heart of God's people, people begin to go, I want to give to the Lord's work, right? I want to give to the Lord's work, no matter what it is. If it's a dollar, if it's $10, if it's $100, if it's $1,000, if it's $10,000. God wants everyone to give to the work of the ministry. I want you to see this illustrated beautifully in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 35 for a minute. Exodus chapter 35, we have the people of Israel here being called upon by God to look at what God has called them to do, and then it is to build the tabernacle. He's revealed to them how they are to build this tabernacle. He has revealed to them his purpose in this. He's going to dwell with his people. He's going to go with them into the land. They're going to see his glory. He's going to dwell. When that tent moves, they're going to move. When his glory moves, they're going to move. And he begins to outline, God outlines to Moses what he's going to do through this. And then God calls the people. Now, Larry, you'll like this because God even gives them the blueprint on how to do this. And these blueprints are laid out. Where the rafters are to be, where the bathrooms are to be, where the doors are supposed to be, and what furniture is to be in this tabernacle. And it is a big ordeal. But God says, this is what I've called you to do. Here's what I want you to do. And in verse 20, we begin to see how God works among them. After disclosing this, look at verse 20. It says, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. So Moses has disclosed to them everything that God is going to do and how they are to be used in this process. In verse 21, it says, Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meetings. That's the tabernacle. For all its service for the holy garments. Then all those whose hearts moved them, both men and women, this is everybody, okay, came and brought brooches, earrings, signet rings, bracelets, all articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering to, of gold to the Lord. Every man who had in his possession blue or purple and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin, dyed red, Porpoise skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the Lord's contribution. 
And every man who had his possessions, a kea wood, from any work of the service brought it. All the skilled women spun their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material in fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with a skill spun goat's hair. The rulers brought the oxen stone and the stones of setting for the ephod and for the breastplate and for the spice and the oil and the light and for the anointing of the oil and for the fragrance of incense. Do you see what is happening? Everybody in the congregation of Israel participated in the contributions of giving to the work of this most sacred ministry of building the temple. Now this was responsive giving to the needs of the church or the needs of Israel. And I want you to see how glorious this giving really is. I want you to turn with me to the next chapter, chapter 36, verse 5. And if you look at verse 4, it says, And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came each from the work which he was performing, and they said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than enough for the construction of the work which the Lord commanded us to perform. And Moses issued a command, and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp, saying, Let no man or woman any longer perform the work of contributions of the sanctuary. And thus the people were restrained from bringing any more. They had to tell the people to quit. That they had enough. They had plenty. They had an overabundance of need. We see the people responding to the work of God. You see, these people were moved in their hearts to give. They were stirred, the text says, not only to give of their contributions from their you know, all these, this jewelry that we see they were giving, but they were willing to give of their time and their talents and their efforts to the building of this wonderful tabernacle. This giving was so born out of their desire to see the tabernacle built that God had, Moses had to tell them to stop. Oh, stop. Listen, this is the type of giving Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 16. The people here in 1 Corinthians 16 were to see they were part of this ministry each one of them was to give all of us are to give paul is saying each member giving each member contributing to the needs of the church body listen great bible church there is no reason for any of us those of us here in this church not to give we're called to give we're called to give to the church we're called to give regularly and we are called to give personally. Next, Paul talks about the amount we are to give. The giving was, point four, was proportionate. Notice what he says. He says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. This is giving in proportion to what you have. Right? This is what Paul's saying. But Paul's giving me some specific instructions here. He says, the giving here is categorized as to put aside and to save. You see that? So during the week, right, this would be in the context of six days, you were to put aside money. You were to save a certain amount. And Paul uses two interesting Greek words here. The first one is tithomi, which means to put or to place or to lay aside. The New American Translation says to put aside. What are we to put aside? Well, we're to put aside, obviously, something for the collection. Another point here I want you to notice is this is a command. This is in the imperative. It's not a suggestion. He's saying, do this. This is what you were to do. He's telling them, basically, to prepare for Sunday. That's what he's saying. You need to prepare to worship by setting aside what God gives to you so that you can worship God through the act of giving. So the first step here, Paul says, in everyone doing their part, everyone on Sunday doing their part, so during the week, the first thing we are to do is to set this money aside so that we can give it on Sunday. The next word that, the, that we have in this passage here is the word save. Paul uses this word. This is a word I'm not going to try to say because it comes from the word thesaurus. 
Where we get the word thesaurus is this Greek term meaning to save. Now, if we think about what a, a thesaurus is, what is a thesaurus? It is a book with tons of words in it, right? I mean, a thesaurus ha- is, is a book with all kind of words. He's telling you that you are to have a collection of money at home that has a bunch of money in it. It's savings. It's the old piggy bank idea. So we're to put aside and to save money each week so that we can give to God on Sunday. So the command here is to save money, to set money aside for the collection. Paul is giving us pretty good advice about preparing to give as an act of worship. Listen, this is deliberate thinking, right? It's very deliberate. Paul wants them to think about what they are to give. I want them to pray about what they are to give. To set aside. Well, here's the money that I get from my job, or here's the money that I get every week. God wants me to pray, Lord, what amount, right here, that you've given me, I'm going to take a portion of that, and I'm setting it aside. That's what Paul's saying. So that I can turn around, and give it to the collection on Sunday. This is what Paul's teaching. This is deliberate giving. This is deliberate preparations to give on Sunday. Paul wants them to be thinking about giving, praying about giving, looking to set aside money so that they will have something to give each week. Wow, this is such a practical way for us to be used by God if we would do these very things. If we would give like this each week, prayerfully considering what to save, how might God grow this church for His glory? In meeting the needs of those people in this congregation. In giving as an act of seeing the gospel going not only from this local assembly to the streets and highways of this local area, but also to the nations and to the world. This is what Paul is saying. This is how we are to think when we think about these practical aspects of giving. Next, Paul talks about the amount. Now, this is where everybody, this is what you want to know, right? All right, I know I'm supposed to give. I know i got to save, but how much, right? I mean, that's it. Everybody has that question. How much am I to give? Well, Paul tells us very clearly what we are to give. As he may what? Prosper. As you prosper, you are to give out of that. Basically meaning as you make an income. As the money that comes in, you determine in your heart what you're going to set aside. You determine in your heart what you are going to give to God. Do you see a percentage? And we're going to talk about that next Sunday, but you don't see that here. You don't see a percentage. He says you give as you, what? Prosper. Now listen, this doesn't take you off the hook. Not to give a percentage. This is going to probably put you on the call to give more than a percentage. Because some of you may prosper more one week than the other, right? You may get a bonus. We're like, well, pastor, that's mine. (laughs) Really? See, this is why Paul is saying every week we are to do what? We are to put aside and to save. Because every week is different. Right? We prosper differently at different points and times. And we need to consider that as God prospers us. And what God would have us to give. That's why I am a very, I'm a proponent of giving every week. We give every week as a family. Now, I could give twice a month. I could. But I don't. Because I think this is very clear. I give every week out of what God gives to us as a family. And we do this faithfully. And this is what I think Paul is encouraging this church to do. We give according to our prospering. These are not rules, but according to what we have. Paul calls us to give from that. Gordon Fee again makes this point. He said, this, 
There is no hint, now listen to this, this is, this is for you legalists in the congregation. <laughs> he says, there is no hint of tithing or proportionate giving. He said the giving is simply to be related to their ability from, week, listen to this, week to week as they have been prospered by God. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Listen to, listen to Solomon. Verse 9, he says clearly, Honor the Lord from your wealth, and, for from this, and from, from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. You see here, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, tells us to do what with our money? It's not a trick question. What does he say? Honor. How do you honor God in your giving? We are to honor God in our giving. And one way we honor God in our giving, according to this passage, is to give from the first fruits of... Okay, wait a minute, let's see. This is the translation according to, to what I want of some of my produce. What does it say? All. All that we get. So everything you get from God financially, you are to give what? A portion of that off the top to the Lord. Clear, right? Is that confusing? Is this what Paul is calling us to do? This is what Solomon is reminding us to do. Is that we, are to, we honor God practically by giving to God from our wealth. And we do this from the first fruits of all that we have. What's first fruits? It's the top portion. It's that initial portion. The first fruits in the Old Testament would be the guarantee of what? More fruits. So we are to take that first portion of what God has given to us and we are to say, Lord, what is it that you would have me to give to glorify you and to honor you? That's what God is saying. This is the pattern of giving all through Scripture. All through Scripture, this is the type of giving God has called us to. And this is exactly what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Paul is telling this church that we are to give every week. We are to, each one of us is to give. Each one of us is to lay aside. Each one of us is to save as he may prosper. So the Apostle Paul here is giving us very clear practices for the local church. Our giving is to be church-centered, our giving is to be regular, our giving is for everyone, and our giving it is proportionate. But there's a third thing I want you to see. The giving was to be handled carefully. Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So the Apostle Paul here is talking about how the giving is to be handled very carefully. This is practical stuff here, ladies and gentlemen. Because here, Paul is caring for this gift. And it is proper, think about this, to deliver this gift in a very appropriate way. First thing he says is he's going to write some letters that are going to go with the gift, saying, hey, this collection is from us. We love you in the Lord kind of a thing. And it is for your needs. And then Paul also looked at this church and said the giving needs to be given to, this, this gift, this bountiful gift, needs to be given to what kind of people? Look at verse 3. Whomever you approve, this, this is the Greek word for test. Whoever has been what? Tested. You see, we don't give money, the responsibility of counting money, depositing money, giving money to just anybody. Right? Because this is a sacred thing that God has given to the church. The money that you give is to be shepherded and stewarded and to be protected. And this is what Paul's talking about here. Paul and this church looked at the business aspect. Now think about this. This is business aspect of giving as a significant part of the church's worship. And part of that was protecting this money. They wanted to oversee this ministry of giving and protect it. 
And he says here in verse 3 that they are to do that by putting men and possibly women who have been approved, who've been tested. This money would not be given to people whose, whose hands could not be trusted. So practically, what does this look for the local church? Well, the local church needs to have things in order so that your giving, our giving, is protected. Paul here talks about himself going with those men to tag along in this particular process to deliver this particular gift. And in thinking of this, we need to make sure in our own church, in this church, that we have the right people in the right places to make sure that the gifts that we're giving are protected. Because in leadership of the church, there must be men of character that will not abuse or be tempted to steal or take money or take the handling, even the handling of the money flippantly. And this is what Paul is saying in, this particular, in these two particular verses. So this morning we've seen sort of five practices, really, that the church ought to be engaged in as it relates to giving. Paul, a serious-minded theologian, also was a practitioner of very practical ministry. Listen, we don't need to divorce this idea from our thinking that, you know, it's all about the high and lofty truths, right? It is about that. But it's also taking those lofty truths and see where they meet practical, everyday needs. And this is what the Apostle Paul is addressing. He's addressing these churches to be urgent, willing, to give in such a way that the church in Jerusalem's needs are met. And when we think about our own church, in our responsibility to God in giving. We need to think about, hey, Lord, how would you have us take these, these commands, these instructions, and how well am I doing in these areas? Is my thinking about the church, is, is it focused on giving to the local church so that the local church can do what God has called it to do, right? That's why it's important to think about where we give our money. As Christians, we're not called to give to parachurch ministry. Because this robs the church of the funds it needs to do the church's work. When we think about giving, are we giving in such a way that it's, it's not just rote, or is it really worship? Is your giving regularly thought through, and is it prayed through? And as you think about the needs of this church, and those in this room, how our hearts ought to be filled with generosity and saying, Lord, help me to give in response to what you've done for me. Help me to give because I see those in my own congregation who might need help. And do you see that giving is a responsibility for who? It's for all of us. No matter how much money you make, it's an act of worship. And we should ask God, Lord, every week, Right? What should I give for your glory? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for such practical truths that Paul gives us this morning as we think about the act of worship through giving. And a lot of times, Lord, as I said last week, we don't think about um, giving as worship, but it clearly is. And Lord, you've given us clear instructions from Paul, from Paul here in this passage. And I just pray, Lord, you would help us as a church to really contemplate our role and what you would have us to do. That you would move in us each week to consider, Lord, like, Father, you've blessed us with so much in life. you blessed us with salvation. you blessed us with a family. you blessed us with jobs. And, Father, help us to just be sensitive to how you want us to use those gifts for your glory. And Father, as we move on from this place this Sunday, Lord, and as we go back home and interact with our families, I pray, Father, there would be serious conversations in our own personal hearts and with those in our own family just to really consider what we are to do each and every week as an act of worship so that we may glorify you and honor you so that the church is built up so the church can be the lighthouse in this dark world that we live in. And Father, just use our contributions, Lord. Use our gifts that we give every day for your glory. Help us to be good stewards of the monies that this church has. 
Help us to be wise in considering how we are to spend it and use it to meet the needs of the church. And Father, at the end of the day, we would give you glory because we want to obey you. We want to honor you with our wealth. And we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing one final song in closing to close out the service today. Just.